Hello and welcome to Empowered Health. We have an excellent show today, Vijay. That's right, Michelle. One of the things we are talking about today is how computers, mobile phones, and tablets affect your eyes. I do wonder about the effect of staring at screens all day long. We're also going to get into some cutting edge research on regenerative spine tissue with Dr. Mark Irwin. Before that, let's meet dance movement therapist, Tannis Hugill. By integrating dance movement with psychotherapy, we um, make it possible for growth and healing on both the psychological and the physiological levels. She's talking about dance movement therapy, a practice Tannis Hugel gravitated towards naturally as a professional dancer. I also developed an eating disorder in my teens and I was a pretty um, attached to my eating disorder. It took me a long time. I tried uh, all kinds of therapy. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy helped, uh, helped stop the symptoms. I was anorexic and bulimic, so it helped stop the symptoms for several years until I experienced a great deal of stress. I was touring, I was performing. And it was just more than I could handle emotionally, and uh, so I, re I reverted. A typical dance therapy session starts with a verbal check-in then drawing attention to the body and exploring whatever thoughts, feelings, and images that might come up through body movements. All of our experience is embedded on, in, our, in our bodies on the cellular level. And our minds, our brains, which are part of our body, are, um, I would say merely, but in a certain sense, merely, but they are kind of the, the director, but they're getting, and they're getting all this information through our nervous system out about everything that's happening everywhere in our bodies. The mind-body connection that dance movement therapy promotes is what really hit home for Tannis. And for the first time, she was able to face the root cause of her eating disorder. We hadn't been working very long when there I was in the session and my body just started to enact early abuse. And that was the, that was the piece that was had I, I had locked off. I had no memory, no conscious memory of this. I was very young. Today, Tannis is a registered clinical counselor and a board-certified dance movement therapist in Vancouver. She treats people with eating disorders and trauma. It's something that uh, means a great deal to me. Coming up on Empowered Health. Is the sheer abundance of food variety of food in stores and our laissez-faire attitude about late night chips created a perfect storm for obesity? Welcome back. We've all heard about how bad it is to eat really late at night, especially if you're trying to lose weight. But does the time you eat really matter? That's exactly what Randy Shore is here to talk about today. Late night snacks. Take it away, Randy. It's pretty simple math. When calories consumed equals calories burned, your weight should be stable. It shouldn't matter what you eat or what time of day. Want to eat late night snacks? Go ahead. Calories are calories. Just don't go over your calorie limit. Every nutritionist I spoke to sings pretty much the same tune, usually as a way of debunking extreme diets, most of which richly deserve debunking. Now, eating patterns elsewhere in the world vary greatly. Some eat dinner at 10 p.m. Others eat six or eight times a day. But as you're probably aware, North Americans lead the world in obesity. So why is the myth that eating late at night promotes weight gain so persistent? Could there be a grain of truth to the myth? And if so, why doesn't it apply everywhere? In most cases, late night snacking simply adds calories since it comes outside the context of your three squares a day. But is there more to it than that? It's well established that rats that eat a diet full of novelty and different flavors eat more and weigh more than rats who eat the same boring food all the time. You think you would weigh less on a diet of nothing but rat kibble? I know I would. Obesity is very much a disease of affluence, and we can afford more variety than at any time in human history. There are literally tens of thousands of different food items at the grocery store all calling us to sample just one bite. Then last year, a study by the Salk Institute published in the journal Cell Metabolism dropped a spanner in the works of nutritionists everywhere. They found that rats who ate a high-fat, high-calorie chow during only eight hours of the day were just as lean as rats who ate regular chow. 
but rats who were allowed to graze all day long became obese on the exact same amount of food. Now that's a head scratcher, but there's more. Round the clock eaters also developed liver disease and suffered from high cholesterol while the rats who fasted for 16 hours a day were lean, fat-burning machines who outpaced all the other rats on the exercise wheel. And remember, they're eating the exact same amount of food. Has the sheer abundance of food, the variety of food in stores, and our laissez-faire attitude about late-night chips created a perfect storm for obesity? Science says, yeah, maybe. I'm Randy Shore for Empowered Health. Your back affects your daily health. Welcome to another installment of Your Spine, Your Health. Because you have a spine, it's important to understand what chiropractic care means to your health. Your health always starts with a regulatory college. In this case, the College of Chiropractors of BC serves to ensure you receive care from a qualified chiropractic doctor for appropriate diagnosis and treatment. That's why BC's chiropractic doctors fund research and education. Today, I want to introduce you to Dr. Mark Irwin. He's performing cutting edge research on how stem cells may prevent disc degeneration. Our work, the work is, uh, is fundamentally of a so-called regenerative medicine, so attempts to kind of repair tissue, cellular, cellular disease and so on. And so fundamentally the work is concerned with the intervertebral disc. Along the way with that investigation, we've um, came across the presence of stem cells inside the disc nucleus and we've been exploiting the, the stem cells in the disc thinking maybe we could harness them in kind of a regenerative capacity. And so as part of that work, we uh, learned how these cells can be differentiated. So a stem cell, by definition, can self-renew and, and depending on their li lineage capacity, they can, they can turn into other kinds of cells. It is revolutionary research that will provide a profound benefit to people with spine arthritis. And so in the last little while, we've been able to turn the stem cells in the disc into cartilage, bone, fat, and various classes of neural cells, where we transplant cells from the disc into the brain of a mouse that doesn't have any myelin, which is the insulating cable around the nerves. We seem to be able to turn the stem cells into neural cells called oligodendrocytes, or the precursors for them. And we found histological evidence that those cells produce myelin in an animal that doesn't have any myelin. So the idea is that these may be able to be harnessed in a, in a therapeutic strategy down the road for some kind of diseases or conditions that, result, that can result in damage to myelin. That's, 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 that's one offshoot of the work. As you can see, it's not just about what we're doing for you today. We're working to build a better tomorrow through better healthcare outcomes for you. The College of Chiropractors of BC sets the standards for safety, outcomes, and your informed consent. Hey guys, this is Simple Fitness Tips. My name is Jameson Wolf, and this is Simona Marion. Today we're gonna to teach you how to perform and progress the plank and the side plank. All right, Simona, let's go ahead and perform the body plank. I'm gonna get you to start with your elbows on the mat, and you're gonna line up your hands with your eyes. You may wanna use something soft so it doesn't hurt the elbows. Your feet are gonna to be together in the push-up position, just as so. I'm gonna place a stick on your back to represent a neutral spine. So you can go ahead and tuck your chin. Great. Now what's important is to keep your glutes contracted the whole time, and make sure your butt's not elevated too high or too low. Good job. To increase intensity, she can go ahead and go on a one leg, or she can elevate her feet on a stool. Let's go ahead and do the side plank. Great job. Feet together, hands on hips. Great. You can lift your butt off the ground. Good. Again, make sure your glutes are contracted and your shoulders are back. Good job, Simona. All right, these are great for strengthening the core and correcting posture. Go ahead and try that out. We'll see you next episode. After the break. Whenever you're looking at anything up close, the internal focusing muscles are engaged and they're working hard. So if you're doing that all day at work on a computer screen, your smartphone or a tablet, it's an enormous weight on those muscles.
Did you know that the human eye blinks an average of 4.2 million times a year? But when you're looking at a computer screen or a mobile device, you actually blink less. I didn't know that, BJ. Well, we're actually going to be getting more information about eye health and technology after we talk to Dr. Bahi about dental implants. In a previous segment, we discussed the benefits of replacing teeth with permanent dental implants. Today, we'll meet one of our patients that has undergone this treatment. I got a couple teeth knocked out, so it's, uh, I've had a partial bridge there for quite a few years. Jack McElhargy is the former assistant coach of the Vancouver Canucks and currently is a scout with the Philadelphia Flyers. Perhaps most hockey fans remember Jack as one heck of a tough hockey player. You may have seen his fight with Terry O'Reilly. Here's O'Reilly going. O'Reilly banging away at McElhargy. O'Reilly goes down, McElhargy pounding away. And McElhargy got the definite edge on that one. It was uh, at a point where we're starting to uh, weakened and needed to be replaced so I started to look into uh, other options. When he came in to see me, it looked like his bridge needed to be replaced. I suggested two options to him. One, replace his traditional dental work or the other was to give him a more permanent solution with several dental implants. Jack chose dental implants. Came in, got an exam, I did some CAT scans and uh, they did a mold and uh, figured out where they have to uh, drill in to put the, the posts in. And uh, they checked all that out. I came back and uh, they went in and drilled into the, the jaw and put the posts in, which I thought that was gonna be, I mean, that, I was in and out of here so fast, I couldn't believe it, it was great. It's just like having your natural teeth. I mean, it's just, uh, the implants are just so easy. They, they, you, you floss in between them where you couldn't do that with your, uh, uh, with the bridge and it just uh, eating food, everything is just, it, you don't even know you have anything that uh, has been put in there. It's just like having your natural teeth. When we're dealing with the computer vision demands, which is really like running a marathon on those eyes all day long. With the increasing demands of devices such as computers, smartphones, tablets, the human eye has not evolved fast enough to be able to adapt. And remember, these are devices that require near vision and omit an artificial light, and we use them all day long. Devices emanate blue light. So you have LED lights and monitors will kick off a lot of, of high energy blue light. And so now the industry has really come up with new lenses, coatings that help to filter this blue light. The long-term effects are still unknown, but it's safe to believe that that much blue light is having an effect on your eyes, your brain, and your ability to get a proper sleep. Whenever you're looking at anything up close, the internal focusing muscles are engaged and they're working hard. So if you're doing that all day at work on a computer screen, if you're doing that by looking at your, your smartphone or a tablet all the time, it's an enormous weight on those muscles. And these aren't the kinds of muscles that you can exercise and build up. The sad and harsh truth is, as you age, these muscles deteriorate and eventually you will lose the ability to focus up close. If you think about two to three times uh, as, as much as you're supposed to when it comes to looking at a computer screen. You know, our concentration on these devices overrides this natural blink response. And you need to blink because blinking uh, is what stimulates your, your tears from getting onto the surface of the eye. Over time, it all adds up to eye strain resulting in dryness, discomfort, blurring of vision, redness, and fatigue. So what to do? The simplest thing is to look into the distance regularly. So the rule we say is a 20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes of near work or computer work, take a 20 second break, look at something 20 feet or six meters away. And what that does is it relaxes that focusing muscle and disengages the focusing muscle. So it's really like putting down that heavy weight that you're carrying. If you are a frequent computer user, talk to your optometrist about corrective lenses or even artificial tears depending on the amount of fatigue and discomfort you feel. A small amount of correction can go a long way. It's about vision, for sure, and maybe it's about your comfort of your eyes, but sometimes it's not as overt as that. Sometimes it's more like, wow, you know, I'm not as exhausted at the end of my work day or work week as I was before I had these visual issues or these eye issues dealt with. Coming up on Empowered Health. 
the, the taste of the veggies and the cheese mm -hmm. come together really nicely. Yeah, and whole grain dough that I think everybody would like. This cooking and nutrition portion brought to you by Save On Foods. Chef and holistic nutritionist Andrea Potter is here from Rooted Nutrition to teach us something called calzones. Andrea, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So calzones, what, so what are they all about? So we're doing it from scratch, uh, which means making your own dough. And uh, we're going to make this dough with a spelt crust. So we're starting with two cups of spelt flour. I'm just going to add a little bit of nice salt. Okay. Do you want to grab that water and just pour it in the center here and make like okay. a well? Okay. You can put all of it in. All of the water? Yep. A couple tablespoons of olive oil. Mm -hmm. This makes a nice rich dough. Mm -hmm. And then, can you see here that the yeasts have started to become kind of frothy? Yeah. So we know that they're alive. Okay. And you can put them in. Perfect. And then you just stir, like starting from the center okay. out. So once it gets to this kind of that consistency, dry, yeah, yeah, dry enough to hold, then I just get my hands in there right. and start kneading it in the bowl. Mm -hmm. When you're rising the dough, you actually want it to have a nice shape so that it right. keeps the air inside. Right. So I just do, I make like a nice circle with it. Mm -hmm. The gluten strands actually keep the air in. Right. That's how you get a nice rise. And because of the yeast now, it's, it's going to rise further, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's go wash up and then we'll come back and make the filling. Perfect. Okay. So I'll get you to stem the chard. Okay. In here? Yeah. Okay. Like your technique, unzipping it. That's good. Um, so I'm just going to chop up some zucchini and we're going to roast these veggies first. Okay. Rather than putting them in raw. Okay. And just slightly roast them. Kind of adds more flavor, a little right. sweetness. Mushrooms are one of my favorites. Yeah, mushrooms are great. Could you crumble some oregano into there? Okay. Perfect. Oh, even the smell is so great. Mm-hmm. And I like to add a little bit of vinegar to this, just to bring okay. out the flavor of the vegetables. Mm -hmm. So um, you can use balsamic. I'm actually using rice vinegar in this one. All right. Just a splash. And then Salt. a little bit of seasoning, mm -hmm. a little bit of olive oil. Perfect. So I'm going to go pop this in the oven for about 15 minutes at 350. 15 minutes at 350. Mm -hmm. Okay. Depending on how thick that you chop the vegetables. Um, but these vegetables are quite nice when they're a little al dente. So. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Okay. So we're ready to go. And I could tell that the dough has risen enough by just pulling up the side. And you can start mm -hmm. to see where the gluten has formed and right. the, the bubbles are happening. Mm -hmm. The way I do this is just pull out the dough. Okay. Bring it out. And it depends on how big you want them. You could do a couple of big, like, family-sized calzones right. and cut them. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do a couple individual ones today. Okay. And a little bit of a technique to this. You may need to uh, dust with flour, but mm -hmm. first just kind of get a feel for the dough. Yeah. So you just move it in circles with your yeah. hand. This takes a little bit of practice. It looks really easy. Mm -hmm, but it's not. So I think the key is to pick up the speed a bit. I'm just comparing the ones you did yeah. to the ones that I did. <laughs> No. They're, a little, they're a little rough. It's okay. It's going to be filled with cheese and then everyone will forgive you. Absolutely, yes. We'll each grab one. Okay. Do a little bit of a sprinkling for this underneath. Okay, and? And we're going to roll these. You actually want more of an oval than a circle for this. Okay. And if it's sticking, just add more flour. So I'll, I'll just demo one. Mm -hmm. I'm using a soft goat cheese. Any okay. pizza cheese would be good, but... Mm -hmm. The soft goat cheese makes it like a really beautiful creamy center. Mm. Just on top of the filling, okay, yeah. and... Um, and then we'll roll it over. Just fold it over itself. Yeah. Um, everyone does a different kind of crimping okay. on this side. I, I do a rope for mine. Okay. And then I'll just like carefully move it. As long as you don't have little holes where the air is all going to come out. Oh, that's the key. Okay. That's all you need. Mm. This is really good, Andrea. Especially the, the taste of the veggies and the cheese mm -hmm. come together really nicely. Yeah, and whole grain dough that I think everybody would like. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you can find out more about calzones in today's Vancouver Sun or find out more about this recipe online on vancouversun.com slash empowered health. Andrea, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having thanks. me. Who doesn't love family pizza night? Be careful though, with a pizza, calories can add up pretty quick. I've got registered dietitian Melissa LeBlanc with me to give us a healthier spin on pizza night. Melissa, 
Welcome to the show. Thanks, BJ. So, pizza is one of your favorite foods as well, right? That's right. I love pizza, but I don't like the calories that come with it. <laughs> so, what's the alternative? Well, having pizza night at home is a great place to start. So, you can also make calzones instead of pizza. And where do you start to make calzone? Starting with the dough, choosing a whole grain or whole wheat dough adds fiber, and of course, loading up your calzone with lots of vegetables. Should the vegetables be cooked or raw? You can either grill them or saute them lightly to add some flavor and also take away some of the moisture that might make your dough soggy. Oh, that's a good point. What about adding meat to the calzones? Again, here you want to keep it lean, so something like shrimp or chicken or lean prosciutto and using less cured meats that are high in fat like salami or pepperoni. Right. On a pizza, cheese is used to bind all the toppings together. But with a calzone, all the ingredients are nicely tucked into a pocket. So, is it necessary to use cheese with this or you can do without it? Well, it certainly adds a lot of really good flavor. So again, just choosing a lower fat cheese like a goat cheese or light provolone or part skin mozzarella works really well. Well, you know, making calzones at home seems like an activity kids would love to get involved with. Absolutely. This is a perfect meal for the whole family to enjoy together. Well, Melissa, thanks for being on the show and thanks for sharing this great info about calzones. Thanks for having me. See you again. Well, that's it for Empowered Health for this week, and I'm going to go home and try that calzone recipe. Oh, you should, Michelle. It was really tasty, surprisingly easy, but mine didn't turn out quite as nice as Andrea's. <laughs> A little bit sloppy, was it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, okay. You keep practicing. I will. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.